So here we are. Right. Yeah. You see me? I can't see you. But anyway, um, a few, uh, a half a year ago, about now seven months ago, I started working on Crimson Pro. Uh, this is a short uh, bias about me. I started, I studied in The Hague about 20 years ago. I finished my studies. I started as a graphic designer and slowly went back into type, which I learned in uh, the Hague at the Art Academy. And I worked with different companies on the which like the Enschede Font Foundry. I was a tutor at different art academies. And now for nine years I've been independent and mostly doing type design over the last few years. Um, I will be talking about Crimson, Crimson Text, which is now Crimson Pro. Um, the first thing we had to do is to look at um, Crimson as it was, and uh, Dave asked me to make a good assessment on um, how it should or could or might be changed. Um, this is this this is the Roman and the bold. As you can see, that this design has been developed about ten years ago by Sebastian uh, Koch. Um, and was one of the first typefaces launched on Google Fonts. Um, so I took a um, thorough look. And so along the way, I see here, um, we found out that Sebastian had continued developing Crimson into Crimson Prime. Uh, the top row of the Roman is crimson text. The second row is crimson prime. The same applies to the bold. As you can see, the crimson prime is much more refined. It's more sharper. It's more has more, a lot of more details. Um, um, which made it a little crisper. But in the assessment we made, we missed a little bit of weight because the original idea of crimson text was to be used in long text for 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 medium where um, for for publication and uh, crimson prime is a little bit too meager too 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 sharp to be used in smaller text sizes for example this is on the italic um, so uh, this is uh, uh, focused you can see on the left side you'll see the crimson texts on the right side you'll see crimson prime um, what you can see very well on this slide is that although in small size it looks fairly okay when you zoom in the outlines are a little rough uh, there are kinks in it um, the bold doesn't really matches the regular especially in crimson text so um one of the conclusion was should we correct what's there or just use it as a kind of source to develop a new solid modern typeface. So that was, um, and after doing some sketches, um, went a little bit longer stretch than we originally intended it to, is to find something that has the, the, the essence of crimson, text and prime, and to combine it with a more effective modern um, uh, functionality. Um, <clears throat> so what we actually did is we kind of mixed. We took the sturdiness of uh, crimson text and a nice little crisp details of crimson prime to um, make a new typeface in a sense, like in strongly inspired on crimson. So what we actually did is the first thing we noticed is that Although it was based on a garment style typeface, which was it's developed in, an, in the 17th century. And it's always been a very narrow typeface. So what we did is to, in, uh, to, to enhance the readability is to open the counters. And the counters are like the, the little holes in a typeface. I'll show you here. This is, an, uh, here I'll show you the counters. Having open counters, makes it read more readable in smaller sizes. But we also added, for example, 
is um, you see like the, the, the capitals are now smaller than the ascending characters. In the original Crimson, they had the same height. When you add such a feature, you like make the text have more uh, different dif differentiation between the lowercase and the uppercase, which makes it in a long way easier to read because you have a more like, um, um, how do you call it? Um, anyway, um, excuse me, my English is not my native language. Anyway, and so this is, we opened the counters and um, we need, the, all no, we also did that in the bolt in the bold. Actually, this is the black. It's the fattest weight Crimson Pro now has. <clears throat> and one other feature we worked on is to stay within the Garamond style. Is the Garamond style in the original didn't have a true italic as we know it nowadays. The italic does is combined with the Garamond nowadays. It actually has another source. But therefore, in the old days. They used to combine upright and sometimes slanted capitals with italics that the, uh, from the Roman. So what we try, what I try to do is to keep um, the metrics of the care of the capitals and numerals the same within the uh, Roman and the regular uh, Roman and the italic. Excuse me. Um, just to keep this little Garmon touch within the the typeface. Um, the typeface is now I have four kind of numerals. It has two kind of tabular numerals, will be like the old style numerals and the lining numerals. On the left, top left is the lining uh, um, uh, tabular figures. On the right is the <coughs> medieval, uh, uh, <coughs> but excuse me, numerals. And um, uh, to be able to set nice tables. If you would like to do that, uh, um, I made all all numerals on the same width within all weights. So you can interchange within a layout in your sheet without having problem of of um, uh, of metrics. This is <coughs> um, Crimson has been now uh, expanded to the Google Fonts Pro encoding which covers a lot of language, for example, Vietnamese, Turkish, or a lot of Eastern European languages. And um, so it's, it can be used widely uh, throughout the whole world now. <coughs> in the original layout, Crimson text had three weights, in Roman and Italic. These, those, here are the original weights of Crimson text, so it's regular, semi-bold, and bold. Uh, same in the italic. Uh, we expanded the, the range to eight weights for both Roman and italic. So actually, we went um, two weights further down the scale to each direction of the original. So we have now extra light lights, two regular, and extra bold, and black. This makes it a far more versatile uh, than it originally was. <coughs> um, this is the way I worked. I originally took the the masters. When you design nowadays typeface, you speak with masters because you are uh, when you in the end create new weights. You are kind of interpolating. You make the the, the computer calculate the inner weights, and then you correct them. Uh, so I started with the original weights. And somewhere along uh, halfway the process, um, after deciding to expand the weights, I made two new masters, which I called the WO and a W1000 master, which is um, called this way because Crimson Text, Crimson Pro, excuse me, will be uh, made into a variable font, which is um, using like a thousand units. Uh, 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 scaleless, or uh, uh, how you call it? Um, you can now have generate thousand weights within one font file. I don't know if you are familiar with variable fonts, but this this new OpenType format in which you don't define 
you can define like uh, uh, the, the standard weights, like you see on the right, the eight weights. But using CSS on the web, you can define in between weights on the fly. Uh, <laughs> and to make a variable form, you also need a sender master, which is W500 master. So in the mid, in a, so I started to having like five masters, which I continued working. I continued implementing the original masters I worked on. And I added the two, new, the three new ones. After some testing, and uh, I decided to uh, lose the regular master and the bot master because it didn't make any significant difference in generating the in-between weights. And it's it's you, um, it's far more efficient to work on three masters than to work on five at the same time. Um, here, crimson text is. Uh, here I'm comparing the, the result and result of Crimson Pro with Crimson Text and Crimson Prime. And all in all samples, the X height is equal. In the middle sentence, the middle row is, uh, middle sentence is the new Crimson Pro. The top, the top sentence is Crimson Text. And the lower sentence is Crimson Prime. You'll notice that the regular is slightly heavier as the Crimson uh, text regular. Um, this was done after some tests. Um, the sturdiness was uh, was the color of this regular is, is gentler to read than the original, which a little was a little spiky. So we decided to make it slightly heavier just to be able to give a nicer overall color in text. This is the italic, same same uh, applies here. Top is the crimson text, middle one is crimson pro, and the low one is crimson prime. Uh, here, the, the weights which were equalized, so you can set a Roman regular and next to the italic, and you won't have a color change. Uh, here's a difference in bold. Uh, top part is again, Text in the middle part is Crimson Pro, lower part is Crimson Prime. Excuse me for repeating myself, but anyway, and it is done the italic version. You see that there is much more regularity in both uh, new weights. That the the way it has been constructed is far more regular. Somewhere, yeah, maybe repetitive, but it creates a more a better rhythm overall in the text. This is comparison with large check. I hope you can see it on your screen. The right side is Crimson Pro. The left side is Crimson Text. There have been a lot of energy put also into the spacing and the kerning. Kerning is like uh, uh, local uh, um, problem solving stuff that you can't do with spacing. Spacing is global. Uh, you, see, you can notice a little bit the, 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 the heavier weight of the Crimson Pro, um, but you also can notice the spikiness of Crimson Text. And for this size of text, it's, it's, it's more better for the eye to have a little heavier, just more um, uh, uh, color. This is the italic. Um, same applies here, a little heavier, but far more consistent. And the spacing is a little bit tighter in this case. Um, the same here for the bolt. Uh, yeah, the bolt, exactly. <coughs> uh, and this is the bolt italic. I can't see anyone. I hope you're still not looking at me. <laughs> it's all good. I think we can all see the, the presentation. OK. So then, uh, what also did in the in uh, initial and in the final uh, um, part of the design is to compare to existing to existing Google Fonts because um, we're trying to create a font that was special on itself. We don't have some too much similarities existing fonts on Google on the Google Fonts library. This is Allegria. Top uh, row is always Crimson Pro. Uh, same X height, both typefaces. You notice, for example, Allegria has longer uh, ascenders and descenders. It's it's yeah, it's different, but it's basically that's yeah, different. This is the italic of 
uh, uh, of Alegria compared to this the one of Question Pro. Um, then we have here uh, EB Garamond, which is a Garamond on this as well. Uh, it's even more spiky than um, um, uh, Crypton Text, but still there's uh, enough difference. Enough, it's Crypton Pro. Well, now it's more like a Plantain translation of Garamond, which was the uh, Plantain was typeface developed in early 20th century, slightly based on Times New Roman and Garamond. So it's more sturdy, it's more heavy. This is the italic of Crimson Pro. <clears throat> this is Newton. Um, it's a little bit um, more display like typeface. Still, it has a lot of connotation to, to, to the Gerald typefaces of Google Fonts. It now at the moment has only one italic. It doesn't have a ball italic, so I didn't compare it. And least and but not last is um, Spectral, this has been developed, I think, two years ago for Google Fonts. Uh, very good typeface for long text as well. So you can see that it's, it has similar goals in functionality, but different approaches. Um, here, going to compare the italics. Um, oh, my gosh, Crimson. Caramel for cor Cormorant, 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 excuse me. Uh, which is more like display oriented. Anyway, that's how I would use it because it's very, very detailed, very the high contrast. Uh, high contra contrast is the difference between the thick and the thin parts, which this contrast is usually found in display typefaces for smaller text. It's not really usable. Um, so now we have finished Crimson Pro. It should be like. Uh, uh, um, we have, uh, the, the technical guys have taken it over. So now it's like, what will happen in the future with it? Do you already have an idea? Um, yeah, the first step is to take the original Crimson text and to uh, take it up to the level of um, a Google font should have technically and somehow to the, uh, as a design. So the, the I just started working on it. So what I'm actually doing now is taking Crimson Text as it is, making it work within the, the defined uh, Google Font standards and um, make slight, slight corrections, just almost unnoticeable to make it, to just take out the, the larger kinks. Uh, some more work will be done in the bold because it's style wiles. There's uh, uh, the difference is is too far away, but I'll I could show that in the future on a different deck because I just started on it. Anyway, the goal this time is not to to make a huge step like we did with Crimson Pro, but to just really stay within Crimson Text and just make it fit, make it to uh, a. Um, a small raisin has been called it, like a small, concise project to match the new uh, Google Font standards. <coughs> um, Google Font, uh, uh, Google, excuse me, uh, Crimson Pro, as stated before, was made for long text, small, uh, relatively small sizes. Um, but being uh, uh, we, and we set it up as a potential variable font, which is something that we want, uh, Google Fonts is going to emphasize on next year. So that's how why I made this WO and W1000 master setup. Um, but being in a text font, you might want to have more uh, uh, functionality. So one of the things you could add is an optical size axis. An optical size axis is um, that visually text or the characters uh, 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 change when you need to change size. That's because of your eyes just cope differently with small objects or small pictures than with large pictures. So, and, um, so type is always designed for a specific point size or a, a, and a relatively to the distance of reading. Uh, so the smaller you get, the the different it 
the, the uh, so you should I technically make for each size a different design. So that's why you could add an optical axis in which you uh, uh, instead of making weights, you make just cor optical corrections as an axis to uh, to be able to use. Uh, Crimson Pro on a far larger scale from very tiny text to very large, maybe post or the text to make it more uh, um, diverse. And then something that you might might be interesting as well is to add a width axis without going into extreme width, just to correct uh, um, uh, better uh, correct text fitting overall. So just imagine that if you have like fluid contents of your website, you change your window size, that all text rearrange itself, but you don't want to have those huge gaps constantly. So what you can add is like to add like a it's just a, a minor width axis, like I said here in text, about 10%, which is, should be more than enough um, just to make to keep a constant good looking text in all situations. <clears throat> um, since 2016, Google has been uh, very involved in the development of Opta variable funds. And um, lately, they have been involved with David Burlow, which has been working on a similar approach, actually for over 20 years. But uh, um, the output devices weren't ready for it, like uh, like printers or like screens or like the internet wasn't ready for his approach. But the new variable font technique makes it possible to implement his new approach. And um, his new approach is so, is a called parametric uh, topography. And the difference is as follows: the classical view of of Type design is uh, and working on different weights uh, and nowadays on variable fonts is that you work with axis and every axis had two extremes. In the case of Crimson Pro, it has three, but that's another that's another story. Anyway, so let's basically say you have two extremes. You have on the um, in my example on the left side a very thin one and on the right side uh, a very thick one. A very fat one it would be like extra light to black in the first picture. If you would, ex for example, wanted to add an optical axis or a width axis, you will need to double up each axis to create interpolatable um, uh, uh, outlines. So in the second picture, you see like I added a width axis. Let's that's the vertical one. So I have to make a narrow, very a narrow extra light and a very fat and a narrow black. So that will be like four masters. And if I would like to add an optical axis to this, I will have to double those four. So it's an action exponentially. Uh, um, every time you add an axis, you increase your font exponentially. So such also the weight and the complexity. Um, David Burlow, oh, that's what, I, that's what I just explained about that. Yeah, each every time add an optical uh, an axis. Anyway, um, and this, for example, is a sketch I made at the end of working on on Crimson Pro with the, uh, this classical approach of using uh, the square as well with the width. An optical side. Uh, this, this. Uh, excuse me. This one. So I would have like a optical size and a weight side, a weight axis. So <laughs> in this drawing, the four corners would be the the extremes. Uh, at the, um, the middle one is the Crimson Pro I draw. I've been working on lately, and I made sketches for potentially optical axis. So the 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 top. Uh, row is for large sizes. You see that the the contrast has increased. There are more details. It's a little. Uh, uh, um, it's it's more crisp. It's it's the, the 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 spacing is more narrow because it leaves less less spacing. The more the bigger you get, and the opposite is the lower row. Is that you see that 
the contrast almost flips. <coughs> it is due to the fact how your eyes work in the very, very small sizes that you have to emphasize the horizontal parts of your typeface. You don't, you can't, you, it's unnecessary to add a lot of detailing. So you're just making everything a little bit rougher. But at the end, when you look at it in small size, it, it should look exactly like you see. Um, uh, uh, the, the, it sh actually should always look the same uh, if you use uh, all axes in, a, in, a, in the right size. Um, what David Burlow did is actually the opposite. Instead of making axes the, uh, on the classical way, he um, deconstructed the design approach. So like I told here, if I make, for example, look at the bottom row. Um, if I make a typeface of very small size, one decision would be I have to make them wider. If you compare it to the middle row, you see that the N is wider uh, in the lower uh, uh, samples than in the middle ones. Uh, another decision would be is to change the contrast. Uh, the thin parts are thinner in the top rows than in the lower rows, and so on and so on. So every design decision is in the, on, in the classical approach will be uh, fitted in one axis. What David Burlow actually did is that instead of making all decision into one axis, he made every axis for each decision. So that's a different approach. So in um, in my drawing, you have like a center core, there's a center outline, and a different axis. And all, every axis is a design decision. For example, one could be uh, change the contrast. That's all it does. The other is we make serif fatter. Uh, the, the third could be uh, make the type wider, and so on. So, so each decision will, uh, has been de deconstructed in, uh, in uh, uh, two to different axes. Um, this is in my when I first encountered it a few months ago and learned about it and had a talk with Dave and, and David Burlow. It felt to me like it, it's it's as if you were having getting a cooking book and a whole supply store with it because you could actually do what you wanted to do. I'll show you. For example, um, if you would gener want to generate a typeface for a specific uh, context, specific size, uh, specific uh, device, for example, a, 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 a reality glasses or uh, um, an, a, a mobile with a small screen or a large screen TV, whatever, um, you can on the fly generate a sp uh, uh, very precisely for that device the font you want to the right size. Um, <clears throat> I hope it's clear. Um, for example, on the left side, you see the classical approach. So if you want to have a specific size for a specific uh, uh, context, you'll be able to generate one font with it, this cube, for in this case, with three axes. But you can only generate that one. That won't. So even if you have different dis devices, you won't be able to change the font. When you look to the right, in my sample, um, in the end, I have made two scribbles, um, a purple one, and the other one looks black, but should be blue. Um, it could technically be looking exactly the same as if you would put your mobile device, which could be the pink one, next to your large TV, which could be the black one. By the end, the typeface will look exactly the same, only it has to be cooked differently because it's using percentages of access to differently. As you can see on the right side of the right picture, you have all those axes going down. There's all like tiny, um, you can really, you, you only change one axis if you want. That will be refitted to the device or um, on, on the fly, which makes uh, the parametric approach far more diverse uh, and interesting than the classical uh, multi master uh, approach. So I'll be closing down. I hope it was clear enough. Um, 
uh, it feels like it, it feels like you will go back to cook and that's very interesting and i hope it was um clear enough thank you very much